This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on insurance. I'm an attorney who has retired from the practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant and expert witness and author and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to talk about what I believe to be the effect of the tort of bad faith. It is indisputable that in the 1950s and 1960s and 70s, the insurance industry abused some insureds to avoid paying legitimate claims. Without a factual basis, insureds were accused of arson or other variations on insurance fraud. Indemnity payments were refused on the flimsiest of excuses. People were found to have diseases that only horses could catch. Disability payments were refused because an insured was wheeled in her wheelchair to church one day and therefore was not totally house-confined. Insureds were driven into bankruptcy when reasonable demands within policy limits were refused and excess judgments were entered against the insured. To stop this abuse, the courts of the state of California invented the tort of bad faith. It took a universal contract remedy and decided that the breach of an insurance contract without what the court decided was proper, genuine, or even fairly debatable reasons was transferred from a contract breach into a new tort. Many other states have followed the lead. Until the invention of the tort of bad faith, all that an insured could collect from an insurer that wrongfully denied a claim were the benefits due under the policy. After the creation of the tort of bad faith, the courts allowed the insureds to collect, in addition to the entire panoply of tort damages, including punitive damages. It worked. Insurers treated the insureds better. The threat of punitive damages made insurers wary of rejecting any claim. The creation of the tort of bad faith was in many ways a good thing for insurers and their insureds. What the courts that created the tort of bad faith did not recognize was that it was also the key to Pandora's box of abusive lawyers who found it to be a new profit center for their practices. The law of unintended consequences struck with vigor. Lawyers flocked to every available courthouse to take advantage of the new tort. The law of unintended consequences can be defined as the understanding that actions of people, and especially of government or the courts, always have effects that are not anticipated, nor were they intended. Insurance is controlled by courts through appellate decisions and by governmental agencies through statute and regulation. Compliance with the appellate decisions, statutes, and regulations different in the various states is exceedingly difficult and is always expensive. Even if a claim against an insured is fairly debatable, an insurer is nonetheless obliged to engage in settlement discussions in an effort to relieve the insured from the burden and expense of litigation. Therefore, insurers must understand that even if the lack of coverage is fairly deba debatable or there is a genuine dispute, it still may be held to protect the insured regardless of the lack of a duty to defend or settle. States that use the tort of bad faith to force insurers to provide benefits exist and are continually taking advantage of the tort of bad faith to force insurers to pay claims they did not owe. 
This was described by Justice Kaus of the California Supreme Court back in 1985 when he stated, quote, The problem is not so much the theory of the bad faith cases as its application. It seems to me that attorneys who handle policy claims against insurance companies are no longer interested in collecting on those claims, but spend their wits and energies trying to maneuver the insurers into committing acts which the insureds can later trot out as evidence of bad faith. This was a decision of the Supreme Court of California called White v. Western Title, decided on December 31, 1985. The decision in White v. Western Title was rendered on the last day three of the justices and the chief just justice were forced to leave the court by a vote of the public. Some speculate that spite against those who helped them lose an election, insurers, was a consideration for the decision. As a result of the White v. Western title case, litigation and settlement in California, whenever an insurer was involved, became more difficult. An insurer could be held responsible for litigation tactics it found necessary to defeat a wrongful bad faith claim against the insurer, or at least what the defendant insurer's claim were wrongful litigation tactics when defending an insured. The case allowed evidence of settlement negotiations, usually protected, to be admitted to help prove the insurer acted in bad faith. The White decision that allowed such evidence in a bad faith case has been criticized as unfairly compromising a defendant's right to defend himself, but it is still the law of the state of California. When an insurer is sued, it could be charged with bad faith, for taking what the plaintiff in a court felt were too many depositions, unsuccessful motions for summary judgment, or failing to offer an appropriate amount at a settlement conference. It is now essential, before starting settlement negotiations in the state of California, directly or in settlement conference or mediation, as a result of the White v. Western title decision to have all parties waive the holding of the Supreme Court before negotiations begin. Insurers, since, began the practice of requiring what is known as the White Waiver before discussing settlement at the claim stage and during litigation. Insurers have asked for a release to be signed by the insured, stating that settlement discussions are kept private and therefore the conduct of the insurer in providing any settlement discussion under the white waiver cannot be used to establish bad faith against the insurer. The decision in White v. Western Title has proved the adage that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Although the court had apparent good intention of protecting an insured, against what it saw as wrongful conduct by an insurer devastated the ability of insurers to defend themselves against unfounded bad faith lawsuits and encouraged more bad faith litigation. Critics of White and opponents of the admission of litigation conduct as evidence of bad faith raise four arguments. One, sufficient existing protections. The trial judge, rules of civil procedure and ethics rules protect insureds from improper insurance litigation conduct. Two, relevance. The litigation conduct of an insurer's lawyer is only marginally probative of the insurer's claims handling Furthermore, the prejudice resulting from placing litigation tactics before a jury substantially outweighs the probative value of such evidence. Three, chilling effect. 
the possibility that an insurer's litigation conduct may be admitted as evidence of bad faith has a chilling effect on the insurer's defense and for attorney compromise. Attorneys for insurers will be unreasonably constrained in their advocacy and will be required to continually evaluate whether they will be advocates or eventually end up as witnesses at a trial. In J.B. Aguirre v. American Guarantee, a 1997 decision of the California Court of Appeal, it affirmed a judgment of dismissal on demur, holding a liability insurer did not act unreasonably as a matter of law in refusing to meet the plaintiff's $2 million settlement demand despite the alleged risk of exposing the insured to uncovered punitive liability. The insured's alleged fear of his punitive exposure coerced him to contribute to a settlement out of duress. Looking through the form of the transaction, the California Court of Appeal recognized that looking to its economic substance, it must as Justice Neal stated, quote, What we have here at bottom is an effort by the insured to concoct a bad faith claim out of whole cloth with the ingenious assistance of counsel. The insured has attempted to position itself to pursue a high stakes bad faith case seeking punitive damages from which it hopes to emerge not only with the underlying claim disposed of at no cost to the insured, but a profit as well in the form of damages recovered from the insurer. Bad faith litigation is not a game where insureds are free to manufacture claims for recovery. Every judgment against an insurer potentially increases the amounts that other citizens must pay for their insurance premiums. Close quote. The logarithmic growth of insurance fraud in the state of California and other states that have allowed tort damages for bad faith breach of insurance contracts may be directly traced in part to the judicial creation of the tort of bad faith. Before the tort of bad faith, insurers with a reasonable belief that an insured was presenting a fraudulent claim would refuse to pay it and file a suspected fraudulent claim report with the Department of Insurance Fraud Division or the Fraud Bureau in the state. Persons perpetrating the fraud would, in most cases, accept the refusal as a cost of doing business, and went on to their next fraudulent claim. After the recognition of the tort of bad faith, those who perpetrated fraudulent insurance claims that were denied went to lawyers instead. Suits for bad faith popped up like wildflowers in the desert after a rainstorm. Juries angered by insurers accusing the, their insureds of fraud punished the insurers with multi-million dollar judgments. After each judgment, hundreds of cases settled, e even though no money, monies were owed, for fear of being victims of the same out-of-control juries. Fraud units that had been instituted in the 70s were disbanded in the late 80s because of fear of punitive damages judgments, and only reinstated after states passed statutes requiring insurers to maintain insurance fraud investigation units. Insurers need to recognize that since the 1950s, when the tort of bad faith was created, courts more frequently recognizing the abuse of bad faith find that there is a fairly debatable issue of law or a genuine dispute like the application of a private limitation of action provision of a policy will defeat both a breach of contract and a bad faith claim.
the tort of bad faith has served its purpose. It is time for it to be removed from the lexicon of insurance law and from the courts and return to the ancient privilege of a contract breach allowing for damages solely for the breach of the contract. And it is no longer or should never ever again be considered a tort. This video was adapted from my book, It's Time to Abolish the Tort of Bad Faith, which is available as both a Kindle book and a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be of interest or useful to you or your colleagues, please pass it on. It's free. And please also subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and my blog so that you can learn about future videos and future blog postings. Thank you for your attention.